In this lesson, we're talking about cyclic vomiting syndrome. So we're going to talk about what this condition is. We'll also talk about the triggers for having episodes of this condition. We'll also talk about the signs and symptoms, how it's diagnosed, and how it's treated. So cyclic vomiting syndrome, or CVS, is a chronic functional gastrointestinal disorder involving paroxysmal and recurrent episodes of nausea and vomiting. So it's going to be long lasting, so it's chronic. It's going to be a functional disorder, meaning that the underlying cause is unknown. And it's also going to involve paroxysmal, meaning that it's going to have these very all of a sudden type of episodes of nausea and vomiting. And these episodes are going to recur over time. So the etiology for this condition is unknown, but there is likely a strong genetic component for this condition. As we will see, there are some conditions that are associated quite strongly with this condition. Now, the median age of onset for this condition is roughly 4.8 years old. So it usually has an onset during childhood. So it's often going to be considered a childhood onset condition. But in some cases, if the onset hasn't occurred in childhood, an adult may have an onset of this condition. And usually the average age of onset for an adult is 21 years old. So if they grow up and they haven't had an onset yet, and they're an adult, their average age of onset is still going to be quite young, around 21 years of age. Now, as we just mentioned, this condition is associated with other conditions, and some of these include chronic fatigue syndrome and migraines. So we're going to talk about the interplay between migraine headaches and cyclic vomiting syndrome in the next slide. And there is a similar condition that can occur in long-term cannabis users known as cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. Now, this is very similar to cyclic vomiting syndrome. The signs and symptoms are very similar as well, but it's not considered the same condition with regards to CVS. The etiology is unknown, whereas with cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome, it is due to long-term cannabis use. And there are other underlying pathophysiological differences as well. We're going to talk about cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome in another lesson. So as mentioned before, there is a strong association with migraine headaches and cyclic vomiting syndrome. Now, if there is a family history of migraine headaches, you're more likely to also suffer from cyclic vomiting syndrome. And in fact, when looking at a group of patients who have cyclic vomiting syndrome and a control group who doesn't have cyclic vomiting syndrome, the differences are quite stark. 82% of those patients who have cyclic vomiting syndrome have a family history of migraine headaches, whereas only 14% of patients in the control group do. So we can see there's a big difference here, and there is, again, a strong connection with migraine headaches. And even in patients who have cyclic vomiting syndrome, they may end up going on to having migraine headaches as well. So again, we can see this connection. This is going to be important when we talk about triggers and some of the treatments later on in this lesson. Now let's talk about the potential underlying pathophysiological mechanism as to why cyclic vomiting syndrome occurs. So there are some theories as to some of the underlying mechanisms as to why these patients have these recurrent episodes of vomiting in this condition. And some of them have to do with issues with autonomic functioning, so an autonomic dysfunction. And we can also see other theories suggesting that there may be some issue with stress signaling. So some patients have increased corticotropin releasing factor or CRF from the hypothalamus, and there have also been associations with increased ACTH or adrenocorticotropic hormone and increased cortisol from the adrenal glands. And there has been association with elevation of these hormones and the onset of episodes of cyclic vomiting syndrome. So these are some potential pathophysiological mechanisms, but again, it's still not fully understood. And there have been some other possible findings that there is some connection with mitochondrial DNA mutations as well. So this could be another potential pathophysiological mechanism as to why this condition occurs. Let's talk about the symptoms of CVS. So again, it's going to be nausea and vomiting. More specifically, it's going to be these episodes of nausea and vomiting that occur suddenly. So there's sudden onset. They're going to be spontaneous all of a sudden out of nowhere, they're going to occur. So that's where we get that word paroxysmal. They're also going to be recurrent and they're going to be described as rapid fire vomiting. So many episodes of vomiting in a very short period of time. Often what's going to be defined here as many episodes of vomiting is where the patient vomits four or more times per episode and usually within at least one hour. Now patients can have vomiting with or without retching. And what's going to be found here is that there's going to be a particular course as to 
the vomiting itself. So oftentimes when the episode first starts, the vomiting is going to be worse during the first hour, and then it's going to slowly reduce in frequency during the following four to eight hours. And oftentimes the full episode itself may last up to 24 to 43 hours. So these episodes can be long lasting. And once the episode resolves, oftentimes the patient can resolve and feel pretty good within even five hours. So they can feel good enough to eat even within five hours of the end of an episode. Now, what can also be found is that episodes can commonly occur in the early morning hours, so 2 to 4 a.m. This is going to be a typical time for these episodes to occur or when the patient first wakes up within the time of 6 to 8 a.m. usually. So this is what these episodes are going to look like. Generally speaking, patients can have relatively normal periods between episodes and all of a sudden they're going to have a trigger that leads to multiple episodes of nausea and vomiting. And then eventually the episode resolves and then they're going to go back into a relatively normal state where they're generally feeling pretty good. And then all of a sudden they're going to have another episode and this continues over time. Now, most of the time, again, in between episodes, they're going to feel pretty good, but in some cases, patients may have nausea even between episodes. So they may have persistent nausea even during times when the episode has resolved. Now, there are other symptoms that can occur in this condition. These include abdominal pain, and there can also be epigastric pain, so pain in the epigastric area. There can also be fever and diarrhea in roughly a third of patients with this condition. Lethargy is going to be common. Patients can feel very sluggish and unwell. There can be pallor as well. These may be due to autonomic dysfunction. We can also see issues with excessive salivation in a roughly quarter of patients. And then some patients may have neurological findings, including headache, photophobia, and vertigo. So these symptoms are going to remind us that this condition is highly associated with migraine headaches. So we can see these types of signs and symptoms in common with migraine headaches. And then some other important information include the fact that nausea doesn't resolve with vomiting. So even if a patient's nauseous and they have these episodes where they are vomiting, even after vomiting, they still feel nauseous. It doesn't resolve with the vomiting. And then an episode of vomiting may actually resolve with sleeping. So if the patient can fall asleep, the episode can stop. Although this can be difficult, we are going to see that there are some medications that can help patients fall asleep so they can actually abort this episode. So again, patients are going to have a vomiting episode that goes into remission, and they will have a triggering back into another episode. Now, there are many different triggers. Some of them include infection. This is going to be the number one trigger that is noted to actually lead to a vomiting episode. Another important one is going to be stress. So if there's any physiological stress, this may trigger an episode as well. As mentioned before, we talked about some of the proposed pathophysiological mechanisms for why this condition occurs, and it may be, again, due to issues with stress signaling. Certain foods can also trigger this. So some of these foods can include cheese and chocolate and foods with monosodium glutamate. So these can trigger a vomiting episode. And if you know much about migraine headaches, you will know that these foods can also trigger migraines as well. So again, we can see that connection here. And then sleep deprivation is also another potential trigger as well. And there are other potential triggers as well, including excitement. So this can actually lead to a triggering of this as well. Now, just briefly, we'll touch on cannabinoid hypermesis syndrome again. And what will be noted is that patients will have these cyclical episodes of vomiting. And then the symptoms that can be found in this condition can be improved with hot showers and baths. So oftentimes these patients are going to take prolonged hot showers and prolonged hot baths to help resolve some of their symptoms. So that is something we'll talk about when we talk about this condition in the cannabinoid hypermesis syndrome lesson. Now let's talk about how cyclic vomiting syndrome is diagnosed. So it is going to be a clinical diagnosis. We're going to use criteria to diagnose it. So there is a Rome 3 criteria, and this is going to be used to diagnose this condition in adults. So we're going to need these criteria, acute onset of vomiting episode that lasts less than one week, at least three separate and discrete episodes in the past one year, no nausea or vomiting between episodes, and no gastrointestinal central nervous system, biochemical or metabolic disorder that may actually be the cause of it. So if we have these criteria, that's enough to make the diagnosis in an adult. And then there's a separate criteria that's used for diagnosis in children. So the criteria in children includes that episodes of severe nausea and vomiting occur from one hour to up to 10 days. Episodes occur at least one week apart. There's at least five episodes or at least three episodes over the past six months. 
vomiting occurs at least four times per hour. There's a normality or the patient feels better between episodes. There's a stereotypical pattern where it's on and off and it is not attributed to another disorder. So again, we're going to see that we're going to have these recurrent episodes of multiple bouts of vomiting and then there's going to be a period where the patient feels better and then they can have another episode where they have multiple bouts of vomiting. The way to summarize it is that there's at least four bouts of vomiting per hour during an episode and there is less than two episodes per week. So episodes are not going to occur very, very frequently, but when they do occur, there's going to be many bouts of vomiting. So this is what CVS is going to look like. Now let's talk about how clinicians treat this condition. First, it's going to be important to avoid triggers. So we talked about those triggers before, but some other things we can do include using benzodiazepines like lorazepam to treat for acute and severe stressful episodes. So if the patient is prone to very, very stressful episodes like panic attacks that may trigger a CVS episode, benzodiazepines can be useful. Sleep hygiene is also going to be important. So we talked about poor sleep being a potential trigger of this condition as well. And then with regards to cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome, it's going to be important to stop cannabis use. So first they're going to have some difficulties, but it will get better over time. Now for the medical treatments in CVS, we can use prophylactic treatments. So these are going to be used daily to help reduce the risk of having an episode in general. So these include amitriptyline, ciproheptadine, propanolol, and erythromycin. These are going to be prophylactic treatments. And if these prophylactic treatments don't work and they end up having an episode, we can use abortive treatments. So these include ondansetron or zofran, triptans, and promethazine. So triptans are actually used for abortive therapy in migraine headaches as well. And in fact, triptans are actually more effective in patients who actually have a family history of migraines. So if there is a connection with regards to the patient having migraines, whether that be they themselves have migraines or their family has migraines, triptans can be more helpful than other types of abortive therapies. And then if the prophylactic and abortive therapies don't work, supportive therapies can be used. So these may not help to stop an episode, but they can help reduce symptoms. So these can include NSAIDs or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen, IV glucose, so giving IV glucose can reduce the severity of these attacks or these episodes. Diphenhydramine, so this is Benadryl, and chlorpromazine can also be used as well. Diphenhydramine and chlorpromazine can help to prompt the patient to fall asleep, and this can, as we mentioned before, stop the episode. If they can fall asleep, it'll stop the episode. So that's going to be important as well. Please check out my lesson on cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome, and also please check out my lesson on trigeminal neuralgia and on migraine headaches. If you found this lesson helpful, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. And as always, thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.